Hey y'all, welcome back to the Hack Shack. Today I'm back tinkering with my Sun workstation stuff again. Now I know these aren't the typical fun retro machines like most of us like to play with, you know, any of the old 8-bit stuff or 16-bit home stuff, but I still have a big bit of nostalgia for these. These really remind me personally of a time that harkens back to like right before the internet really took off and when I was trying to learn a bit more about Unix systems. You know, the first real video that I mustered up the courage to post to YouTube was my Spark Station 5 rescue video. If you're interested in that, I'll put a link to it in the description or maybe up here or wherever it goes. Yeah, if you want to see my love letter to Sun, you could check that out. I won't make you listen to that in this video. Back when I did those original videos, I was hunting around for an SD type hard drive replacement solution. And at the time I found the SCSI to SD from Rabbit Hole Computing and it worked great. I have zero problems or complaints about it. It's just the price at the time was fine. I mean, I don't mind paying what somebody charges for something, but I had a Spark Station 4 and a 5. So I was hoping to be able to find the solution for both of those, but maybe see something or find something that was a little bit more affordable. My main reason is I like the idea of being able to potentially set these up at a show or something to show them off the four and the five together. And by having multiple bootable images on the SD card in each one, I could be just changing the boot command on each one, let folks try out different combinations of things like they can see what next step was like or Solaris or an older Sun OS or NetBSD or OpenBSD, anything like that. I think it's pretty neat. And if someone messes up something accidentally or on purpose, it'd be easy to just throw the image back on there and be back in business. I think at some point in 2022, I was doing my usual, you know, looking around on the retro areas and Reddit and Twitter, and I came upon some Mac folks talking about Blue SCSI. This really caught my attention because it looked like it was a really affordable SCSI solution. I looked around a little bit and did some searching, but I wasn't quite sure if it would be compatible with the Sun slash Spark stuff. When Retrocombs and I went to BCF Midwest in the summer of 2022, I happened upon Ron's table from Ron's computer videos and he and Eric from Eric's Edge were sitting there and on the table, I saw some blue SCSI kits. I was trying to ask them some questions about whether or not they thought this might work on my sun system and they weren't quite sure. But before I knew it, Eric from Eric's Edge had flagged down and called over Eric, the Eric from Blue Scuzzy, the creator of the project. Had a great conversation and he, you know, he couldn't say whether he could guarantee it would work or not, of course. I didn't blame him for that, but he said it might. So that was enough for me to buy a kit and bring it home and give it a try. So here's that kit I got from BCF Midwest 2022. I'll put a link to the original Blue Scuzzy GitHub here. It has some information you may like. Basically, this Blue SCSI V1 was a fork of the Ard SCSINO STM32. It runs on the STM32F103C or Blue Pill, hence the name Blue SCSI, I guess. There's not much to this kit, as you can see, but the thing I was dreading most is this surface mount SD card. I decided to try that first. I knew I would be drag soldering and knew that flux would probably help. So I got some flux, applied that to the pads, positioned the piece and put a tiny bit of solder on my iron and did a few drag attempts. And it looks like it worked okay. The rest of the assembly is just pretty much run of the mill stuff. The latest, current, actually still supported for now, operating system for this old Sun Gear, the Sun 4M platform, is NetBSD 9.3, which is still, right now, in active development. I'm not sure if it'll still be around for much longer, but today it is. So I wanted to try that out. So I grabbed the ISO file for that, and I also grabbed a blank disk 
image file. I'll put a link in the description to the one I used. There are also instructions about how to make your own. It's easy to do either way and just grab one of those. I placed those on the SD card for the blue SCSI version one and they have to be named following a certain convention. I'll pop it up here. You'll see what I did. Basically it's HD or CD and what device it is, like, you know, what SCSI ID it is. And the LUN, if you want to put that in there, is optional. I didn't do that. And then it's going to be like .hda or .iso in the case of the CD. I also took a moment to make sure my blue SCSI V1 had the most up-to-date firmware. With my firmware updated and ready to go and my files on my SD cards, stuck those into the blue SCSI and installed it temporarily into my Spark Station 5 to see if it would work. But no matter what I did, I could not get it to work. The probe SCSI command would hang and I knew the right device, like six in the case of the CD-ROM. I tried to boot CD-ROM, which you know basically is like saying boot disk six, and that also would just hang up and didn't work. So I thought maybe something was wrong and I would check the forums or ask around and see if there's something I was missing about making this work. At that point, kind of gave up on that, but we'll come back to it. Like I said, I'd gotten the Blue SCSI version one from BCF Midwest back in September of 2022. And I'd just now gotten to putting that kit together halfway through 2023 here. Even before I'd started soldering the V1 kit, I had found out about a Blue SCSI version two being out there. And I dug up some information on it and thought I'd go ahead and give that a try too, even before I knew the version one didn't work for me initially. And the only place I could find that had a kit available at the time for the full size 50 pin Blue SCSI V2 was this vendor. So I ordered it up and it arrived. Now the version two kit, has a lot of surface mount components, but they're already on it. So the kit builder only has to install the SCSI connector, several headers for jumpers, the headers for the Raspberry Pi Pico 2040, and then solder the Pico to those headers. And then that's it. You don't have to mess with any surface mount for the SD card because it's already there. I updated the firmware to the latest available and I moved my SD card from the version one blue SCSI to the version two with a small adapter. I gave this a shot on the Spark and I have much better luck. The probe SCSI command on the Spark detected the emulated hard drive and ISO that was acting like a CD drive. I could boot from the CD-ROM and start an installation of NetBSD 9.3. Things started out great and the installation was moving along but it would always crash like this, no matter what I did, multiple times. I tried many, many, many times to see if I could get past this point, but it would never finish. I wondered if I needed to tweak some setting in the optional INI file or do something else to get it to work. I let it rest a bit as I tried to figure out what to do. I looked around, Googled, etc., but nothing really showed up for me. And then most recently, I tried to do it one more time and I happened to brush my forearm across the frontmost RAM module in the Spark. Now this isn't scientific, of course, but it seemed to be way warmer than it should be. And just for the hell of it, I removed this module, leaving the Spark with only 32 megs of RAM, but that was still enough to install NetBSD. And wouldn't you know it, the install finished. NetBSD boots up fine and works. Now I tried to see if there was a big temperature difference with my little infrared thermometer here. I couldn't see a big difference between the one that was acting faulty and the ones that were not acting faulty. Now I will tell you, when NetBSD boots up for the first time, if you're going to use it, every time it boots, it rebuilds like this man page index and it takes a very long time on my gear. If you've got stuff of this vintage, it will take a long time. So you could let that run once. And if you don't necessarily want it to run every time, you can keep that from running on boot up if you want to, and then just run it when you'd like. So it doesn't lag your machine down for a while every time you boot it. Also, when you first boot right here at this point, it'll hang for a little bit while it's doing this font cache thing. Just let it go. It only does that this first time. It's pretty slow, but then it's good. So when preparing for this video that you're watching, I grabbed the V1 again to try to use it to grab some error messages to show and explain during that part of the video. But I noticed something this time that I didn't notice before for whatever reason, this termination on jumper. So for giggles, I removed it. And of course it works perfectly fine. I felt like an idiot. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be quite as fast as the V2. And we'll see that in just a little bit here, but it worked just fine. I could install NetBSD, I could run NetBSD, so I assume it would be fine with anything else I don't want to do with it. But that's all it was. Now what confused me is I think the termination on jumper is on on the V2, but for whatever reason that works. I'm sure there's something, or maybe someone can explain to me in the comments what I goofed up there or how that works, but the other one didn't. I had originally thought I was going to have to give the V1 to someone with a Mac, or maybe it would be an excuse for me to get an old Mac to, to play with that on. And I might still do that. So if you've got a Sun 
microsystems, Spark Station 4 or 5, I can tell you without reservation, without hesitation, that a Blue SCSI V1 or a Blue SCSI V2 will work just fine. There may be some reasons we'll talk about in a minute why you might want to have a V2 over a V1, but for some instances a V1 may be just fine. Both of them will do the job. So now I'm going to show you some very basic benchmark. I don't even think you could call it a benchmark. I use the DD command with the V1 and the V2 and just simply wrote a file out with a block size of one meg with a repeat count of 512. And I timed, you know, you can see the time of how long that takes to write. Then I read it back in with a block size of one meg and time that. So I did that for the V1 and the V2. And I'm going to put these results up here so you can see them. Now you can see it, version 2 is a bit faster than the V1 in this test. Now I didn't repeat these tests or do an average or anything like that. It was just a one-shot deal. But I still think it's probably pretty valid to show that the V2 is expectedly a bit faster than the V1. Now, I also did some bench tests with a SCSI Fujitsu drive that was in the system from before. Now this is a little bit apples and oranges, but I just included it just for comparison's sake. This operating system is the one that was on it, which is OpenBSD from several years ago, but I did the same DD command with the same specs. So as you can see, the drive is slower than the V2, but it seems to be faster than the V1. Now, what about that RAM from earlier? Since the system worked with the one stick of what I suspected was good memory, I decided to replace that and put just the one stick of the supposed bad memory in. It wouldn't even post up all the way or, or come up to the monitor. So that was interesting. Then I put both of them back in like they originally were, and I found the commands to tell the machine to actually test the memory. And you'll see it comes up with this, which is not good. So then I grabbed another stick out of the Spark Station 4 to put in the 5 so it would have you know 64 megs again and did the test and it passes. So not very scientific, but I think that proved that we have a bad piece of RAM there that I'll have to replace. So I've got three SCSI options now that work in my Spark boxes. I also wanted to mention that the Rabbit Hole Computing folks have also made a new project that they've got that I mentioned earlier, Zulu SCSI, which is what the Blue SCSI V2 is forked from. I may try to get one of those just to compare and see how it stacks up, but I assume it would be similar in performance to the Blue SCSI V2. If you know differently that it's vastly superior or something, let me know down in the comments and I'll see if I can get one of those just to compare. The bottom line is there seems to be no shortage of choices of affordable SCSI replacements for our retro machines. So I think that's pretty awesome. Hey, if you made it this far, thanks for watching. Hope to see you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye.